All right, so today, right now, we are going to be talking about your book, Against All Odds, Chapter One, God Bless the Child, which I felt was the perfect title for this book because you talk about you know, your childhood, where you're from, uh, how you grew up, uh, your teenage years and the struggles that you faced, what you saw and how that's impacted you still to this day. Now, you're not originally from Canada, John. Where, where are you from? I was born in Holland. <clears throat> where in, in the, Holland? In the northeastern part of Holland. So if you kind of visualize Holland, uh, you know, the, uh, the, it, it is, uh, Holland is substantially below sea level. <clears throat> it's kind of a delta. The major rivers in Europe run through Holland. It's a relatively small country, about eight, nine million people, highly dense, dense uh, high density, uh, uh, about the size of Vancouver Island. And in the extreme northeast, where it borders on Denmark would be further north, Germany is uh, towards the east. <clears throat> and I was born in the extreme northeastern part. Okay, <clears throat> okay. So uh, you were born 1940, so just... November the 1st, 1940, yeah. So just as uh, the Second World War was picking up, or...? Yeah, it started in April of 1940, so it was already well on the way, okay. yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about that. I actually want to speak about your, your very first near-death experience. You know, you were very, very young when this happened to you. The war was, you know, in, in its full force. Talk a little bit about that experience. Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, you know, Holland was invaded, uh, you know, in April of, of 1940 by the German forces and they called it a blitzkrieg, meaning overran very quickly. Uh, in our family, my dad was uh, a young man, uh, him and his, uh, and my mother, just were married about two and two two and a half years before that, and had uh, in succession three uh, children. Uh, you know the and uh, and she, my my mother was pregnant with me, uh, when my dad was drafted into the army, and uh, so my mother had uh, a one year old and a two year old, being my brother, and then was pregnant with me in uh, 1940, and then. Uh, for the next, uh, then, uh, then during that particular period, what happened in order for the Germans to force Holland into uh, capitulating, uh, they bombed Rotterdam. Rotterdam was a huge, large city mm -hmm. of uh, probably eight, nine hundred thousand people, okay. and they bombed a hole in a part of Rotterdam. Thousands of people died. Uh, you know, the. Uh, uh, for my mother, the last thing they heard is that uh, the last place my dad was seen was in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the next four years, uh, till, till uh, 1945, they didn't know he was dead or alive. And then, uh, uh, then I was born in 1940, and they then won through uh, the war and the war years. Uh, in particular, the winter of 1944-1945 was extremely cold for Holland. Mm -hmm. and they called it a hunger winter. Mm -hmm. uh, the Germans had stopped all foods being dropped into the difficult zones and a lot of people died, uh, you know, because of starvation. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so the uh, episode that you refer to was that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we were liberated on April the 12th, 1945. Uh, the German army came uh, or the the canadians liberated us the canadian army and they pushed the germans right through the western part of holland right through the top back into uh, germany mm -hmm. and the uh, as they came closer the germans towards their border and had been pushed right through there was fierce fighting along the way and uh you know, so the other thing that the uh, Germans would do as they fled, they blew up the bridges behind them to slow down the Canadians getting uh, behind them. In front of our house, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, 30, 40 feet, the width of a street was right the bridge in mm -hmm. front of our house. And uh, we already knew, or they already knew, I was just, you know, five, and uh, but I remember a lot of this, you know, not the magnitude of it, but, uh, you know, the, uh, they were uh, uh, getting ready to, uh, for the Germans to get out of that area. And so uh, uh, my, my mom was aware that they likely would blow the bridge and they hadn't been putting, 
pieces of wood on the windows and, and all those things. And she was uh, finding the kids, uh, the, uh, you know, and she couldn't find me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so, and uh, <laughs> then she had to look all over and somehow she, the, the Germans were underneath the bridge setting the spring loading right. and I was with them. And, uh, you know, so, uh, and, uh, you know, so she, she got me out of there. I, I don't know how. And then I still remember, you know, that we went out of there and then we went to the house and then we had a crawl space under the house, not, not a, uh, a basement, but a crawl space yeah. space. And I still remember as a kid, even now, you know, I remember as a kid laying underneath the crawl space and there was a little window there with a grill grid on it right in front of the main door and the entrance. Years later, you know, when I went to Holland, the house is still there. Oh. And I said to my wife that was with me, I said, I have to look at the door and see if there is a grid there, you know. And uh, I was standing there and there's the grid and there's the window. So uh, so what happened then, uh, you know, the uh, laying there with the pillows on your head, they blew the bridge. Uh, you know, it shocked the whole house, and uh, you know, I still remember that. You know, so. Oh my gosh, that yeah. is quite the experience. Yeah, and then at the same time, uh, you know, during those periods, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on that was very difficult. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, obviously we were uh, again. If you look at the, the the Dutch map, then you can see that from 1943 forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were daytime, nighttime bombings of uh, Germany and the planes would come as much as they could from England over water. Mm-hmm. The reason that they did that is to avoid flak yeah. and, uh, you know, so and they would come through. One of the routes was through northern Holland and then look for Hamburg and, and Hamden and those kind of places that were on water mm-hmm. where the U-boats were and other things. and. Uh, and, and what we would do is, uh, you know, we would a lot of times go outside, if uh, not to kind of look at these planes, but it was, it, it, it gave more of a feeling of security by seeing and being outside. So we had a flat roof behind our house right. and my mother would take us there and then so that we could see it. And if something would happen, it, we would see it coming rather than sitting in the house. So, uh, and, uh, and then way in the distance, we could see, uh, you know, the German cities burning like uh, Emden and, and those kind of places. You could see it in the distance that they were on fire. And, uh, and then a lot of times uh, planes would come back and uh, you could see that they had been shot and several planes uh, crashed in the area where we lived, uh, you know, that, uh, yeah, so all of that, uh, you know, was a daily occurrence, you know, so. Uh, And then because we were in a a war zone that was fairly active, uh, you know, I always remember as a kid uh, seeing a wagon, uh, you know, with a a leg hanging, (laughs) you know, that sort of thing, you know, and, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, when the Canadians came in and liberated us, uh, you know, the uh, uh, people rounded up the collaborators, you know, and the uh, you know, and some of them are shot right by our house, you know, so, yeah. Oh my gosh. A lot of things, like, I feel like a lot of, if you ask any adult to, to recall a memory from when they were five, you know, and to- basically a toddler, right? I feel like you they wouldn't be able to remember, but something like that is... Yeah, I found it always interesting, you know. I like, I look at my grandchildren, you know, mm-hmm. and you have four of them. And, and even at three, you know, so they, they are so aware and so knowledgeable, you know, like, and, and sometimes I say to myself, do I, do I really remember? And they do, they do remember, you know, so, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, some of these things. But, and then uh, the other part about it that, uh, you know, the, uh, and I do a lot of presentations about it, uh, yeah. you know. So uh, in schools on uh, November uh, mm-hmm. the 11th. Yeah. But in any event, uh, you know, so the things that I remember uh, in particular about it, uh, you know, that uh, is anxiety, you know, so because, uh, you know, it was always anxiety, cold and hunger. 
You spoke about your mother there very briefly at the beginning. She brought you and your, your siblings up and you barely saw your father. What happened to your relationship between you and your dad? Well, when he came back, uh, you know, he fortunately survived and worked in the underground in southern Holland. And, uh, you know, and nearly was killed. And I always remember he had this uh, helmet and a bullet right through it. And, uh, you know, so he nearly got killed. And, uh, you know, so, uh, so when he came back, uh, and, you know, right after the liberation, uh, you know, probably in April of 1945, just a stranger to me I didn't know him you know so you know so uh, and the other thing to remember about something like this Veronica is that uh, you know the uh, you know so there you have a young family that just got married and is just having dreams and 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 that they're going to do and get settled in and uh, you know and build the family and all the dreams that we have when we go through that mm -hmm. and then and that's usually what I talk about when, uh, when I talk to uh, kids, uh, young people about it, uh, yeah. you know, that all of a sudden the world changes. You know, what you take for granted is no longer, right? And, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, and it, it happens very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, so, and all of a sudden for them, you know, my dad what, was drafted. Mm -hmm. And then when he came back, Obviously, they had been apart for five years, and they have to rebuild the whole relationship, yeah. right? So because we all have changed, and uh, you know, and then he was affected by PTSD. I'm sure it was not known then well, right? Yeah, so of course. Where now it is much more recognized, uh, you know, as something that uh, is part of it, and and you see, can people get counseling for it and all those kind of things? Then it wasn't, so. I remember about him, he would really never talk about it, you know, so, uh, and, uh, you know, but I'm sure it affected their uh, relationship. And although they uh, were together for a lifetime, virtually, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, it really did affect them. And you mentioned the Canadians ushering the Germans back to Germany. You fell in love with Canada. Tell us a little bit about why. Yeah, so what happened, uh, you know, with us, obviously, uh, you know, that uh, uh, we got liberated uh, April the 12th, 1945, and then right behind our house, there was a schoolyard, uh, you know, and, and again, from here, half a block away, or less than that, uh, was the schoolyard. So <clears throat> we as kids, we would go to the schoolyard, and, uh, and the Canadians would feed us bread with cheese and butter, and the cheese and the butter was bigger than the bread. <laughs> and every morning we would go down there, and then everybody was called Johnny because, uh, you know, and we couldn't really speak the language, but we did, really, you know. So, uh, you know, so it made such an impact on me that I knew from that point forward, uh, you know, I got a ruck rucksack from one of them, and I always remember standing on that flat roof behind our house that, uh, uh, you know, and still looking into the schoolyard and where the Canadians were, uh, I said to our neighbor's wife, I said, I'm going to go to Canada when I grow up. There's no question about that. You know, I'm going to go to Canada. And, and that really never left me. You know. yeah. And, you, and you, well, you're here now, right? We know that. <laughs> so that was one of the dreams that, uh, you know, that I had. Mm -hmm. The other one, obviously, we'll talk about later, was building a lumber mill. And so, uh, yeah. So after the war ended, you know, life continued on. Uh, you were back in school. However, school was something that you you struggled with, you know. And you know, I feel like to put it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your struggles with with school, grade three and grade seven, especially. Yeah. So uh, yeah, with school. Uh, yeah, the and uh, I went to school and then uh, I failed grade three. Well. Nobody fails, fails grade three, really, but I did. So grade seven, I failed three times. And, uh, you know, and I think at the time of year was about uh, uh, May. And then we would get four weeks holidays from school. And uh, I still remember I came home, uh, you know, with my report card. And, uh, you know, it didn't look good. Right? So I failed it again. Oh. And, and so then it became a question of, uh, well, you know, the, my 
dad looked at it in particular and uh, saying, uh, you know, that, uh, okay, the kids would get three weeks off. I, uh, I, I still remember it. Uh, it was on the weekend. He had a friend that had a closing store and we went down to the closing store to find coveralls for me and he had found a job for me in the furniture plant but it would start on monday at seven o'clock in the morning oh, wow so that was it from school straight into work yeah and then i i was relatively small come you know my brother only two years older than me if he put his arm out i could stand right on the knees i must have been kind of a stunted growth or something <laughs> you know something <laughs> <laughs> so in any event so they had these coveralls and they couldn't find a pair that would fit me so i had the crotch hanging about here <laughs> and and the legs were folded up and it's cool now but not then <laughs> You know, so in any event, uh, you know, I want to sc to uh, to work at the furniture factory. So and then uh, before we did that, I believe there was a conversation about uh, should he go to, you know, the men mentally challenged school and, uh, you know, and and uh, I was not kind of ready for that. But, uh, you course. know, but anyway, they chose to then send me to the furniture school. And, and so that's what I did. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it, it, a bit cruel as well, in a way, you know, after the kids went on holidays and I was working. And then by the time September came along, I'd been ever they went back to school, mm -hmm. the kids had the habit of going. We lived about six or seven kilometers away from where the school is. And, uh, and they would all kind of together on their bikes because we all drove bicycles and right. uh, kind of fold into uh, a group and then there was a whole group of people but because I was an, a laborer uh, I was not kind of accepted to be in there so you know it was uh, you know uh, not cool <laughs> anyway so I uh, I got into the furniture uh, uh, business and uh, then I want to work I, I did very well actually and then went to night school to become a furniture maker and then I had this hunger for certain things that I liked mm -hmm. and I already did that then I had an interest in certain things that I really got involved in mm -hmm. and then uh, so I did that for uh, you know the until uh, I was uh, about 17 then uh, in Holland at the time you had to be uh, dra got drafted and uh, I wanted to go into the Air Force. I wanted to be a, uh, a pilot. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, my education didn't lend myself to be a pilot, uh, you know. So uh, then, they, and, and the other thing that I did, and I, I still don't know how, to, how they did that, but uh, I, I got involved in judo. And, uh, oh. you know, and yeah, and I had a brown belt in judo, nearly black. <laughs> and I competed. Uh, and then I was a very good speed skater. And, and uh, you know, so... Anyway, <laughs> the Air Force decided to put me in Special Forces. I have no idea as to why, because, uh, but in any event, so that, that was an extra hard training and I became Air Force Police. And then in times of war, you would go into Special Forces. Mm -hmm. and your chances of uh, surviving usually was considered to be zero. So, okay. So. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So in any event, so I did that for two years. Yeah. and. Uh, was a good experience in a way and uh, mm -hmm. you know so and when I came out of that mm -hmm. uh, you know I then want to work in a lumber manufacturing plant actually my dad was managing a small mill and uh, and I started working there right and and you mentioned in your book you know you were working alongside your father and that that had a little bit of an impact on you. Yeah. What was that impact? Well, the impact was that, uh, you know, he was uh, a very dedicated individual, very, uh, you know, innovative and, uh, you know, doing the job right, had, uh, had, had uh, you know, very, very strong work ethic and uh, was very, very successful in what he was doing. Mm -hmm. and so I worked with him for about a year and then I want to, uh, you know, the, uh, I was in the Air Force from uh, 18 till I was 20. And then when I was, uh, then worked with them for a year. And then from there then was hired by the parent company and ended up in their uh, uh, auditing department. Which, mm -hmm. And they, they, the company is called William Pond, a large importer, the largest importer of Western Europe. 
and uh, had 32 or 33 subsidiaries and I was in a team. I don't know why they put me there, likely because normally what happens is, uh, you know, that the son of a manager usually follows up the existing manager mm -hmm. and uh, so they put me there and then, but I was so determined and so dedicated and, and so hunger for in knowledge that yeah. uh, very quickly I rose into the auditing department and, uh, you know, became very, very good at it and became one of their, in, in their key troubleshooting team. But for me, I wanted to do more, and then they uh, appointed me uh, assistant manager of, an, of one of the other subsidiaries they had. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was doing a very good job there, and then one night I was sitting in my, uh, not only one night, but, uh, you know, I had considered for a while that if I want to go to Canada, I have to make the decision now. Mm -hmm. And I did that, and I said, I'm going to go. I didn't tell anybody. I went to Den Haag, the capital city of Holland, went to the Canadian embassy, mm -hmm. asked to emigrate. I didn't want anybody to sponsor me. And I said, I want to leave in three weeks. And, uh, and so somehow that got approved, and I told my parents about it. Yeah. And then uh, I, I said to myself, I'm going to start with, I want no contacts, although the co parent company I worked for had connections with Macmillan, Bluedown, and some of the bigger force companies. I wanted to start from the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I, I took $150 with me and then off to Canada. July 31st, 1965? Correct. What? Yeah. Okay, so you, you got on a plane and it took you to Montreal, I believe? And Correct. From Montreal, you came to Vancouver? Correct. Okay, so when you you came to Canada, you, you had, your the language was not, you know, your first language, obviously, so you struggled a little bit with that. And from Vancouver, you were told to come up to Prince George if you were pursuing forestry, if you wanted your own sawmill, you know? Correct. So when you got to Prince George, 2547 yeah. is all you had in Correct. your pocket. What happened? Well, obviously, I came off the bus in Prince George. The bus station is still there and, uh, you know, on 6th or 7th Avenue. And uh, I counted my money and uh, twice, three times, and twenty-five dollars forty-seven cents. Couldn't speak the language, didn't know it so. So then I found that they, somebody indicated that the immigration office was above the post office. I won there by pure coincidence. It was in the summer. There was a student working there that had a Dutch background, so I could communicate to him and. Uh, and, they, and he said, well, what do you, would you like to do? I said, and when do you want to start? I said, right now. Mm -hmm. I think it was on Thursday afternoon or so. I'm gonna, I had to start that evening to start. I had a cash flow problem, right? 25, 47, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and he couldn't find a job for me in Prince George. He found one in Quanel, you know, about 75 miles or 110, 20 kilometers south of uh, Prince George. And uh, he found me a job on, on piling lumber in a small sawmill Mm -hmm. Wellwood of Canada and Quenelle. You know. But that job didn't last too long, right? No, it didn't last too long because uh, I was quite happy to go there and uh, I hitchhiked. I thought I'd take the bus just like in Holland every 10 or 20 minutes. No, it doesn't work that way here. <laughs> so I walked all the way to the highway with my big suitcase, two books in it, one set of clothes, and then hitchhiked with my gray pants, my double breasted jacket, my, uh, my little raincoat, and you know, and, and the, the people must have thought I was crazy. They, Who is this guy? So I, finally a car stopped and uh, I couldn't say much other than Quanell Greyhound. So, and uh, you know, that's where I wanted to stop. And then when I landed there or when I arrived there, I called the fellow that promised me the job and uh, you know, I called him Ernie McKettrick was his name, the personnel manager of Wellwood of Canada in 1965. It took me 30 years to thank him for helping me, you know, <laughs> you know, and uh, so, uh, and, and he then helped me finding a place for board and room, and then I had to walk to the mill, it was about an hour and 15 minutes, and... Uh, An hour and 15? 50 or 15? 15 minutes, You yeah. walked? Yeah. Every day? Every day. Oh. There and back, yeah. And... Uh, then, uh, you know, then I didn't, so they found me board in room and that was all good. And then I had to go right away to work. And then, uh, you know, so I came to work and I had the gray pants, the double breasted jacket, the raincoat and, and the white shirt and the tie. Mm. And so I think there was a plywood plant in a small sawmill. I bet you everybody in the plant came to see this crazy <laughs> guy at the end of the chain. 
So I took my jacket off, my double breasted bra and tie off, and, and people are cruel, right? So they, this guy, they were gonna bury him in wood, you know, but they had no idea that my, my, <laughs> my program was a lot further than that, yeah. and I was certainly not gonna be buried in wood, and uh, you know, so, uh, and uh, you know, and then, that went on, uh, you know, for about three weeks, and uh, you know, and then what happened is somebody came to me and said, uh, "Okay, yeah, sign this." Now I'm not anti-union, and in fact, to the contrary, you know. So, but that's what happened. Somebody came to me and said, "Sign this," and I said, "Well, there was a German. I couldn't speak the language, mm. kind of, in, uh, as an interpreter." And uh, he said, "Sign this," and I said, "Well, what is it? You know, well, in order for you to work here, you have to join the union. If you don't join the union, you have no job." I said, well, I want to see the Constitution. He thought that was the funniest thing alive. And I said, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't come halfway across the world, mm -hmm. you know, to, to just sign something without knowing it, but it is. And again, I mean to impress that I'm not anti, but I'm an anti that part. Anyway, so, the, uh, so then I want to earn him a Catholic, and I said, you know, I got to go, you know, because I can't do that. Right. And then and I found something, uh, somebody made a commitment to me in uh, Prince George's, and uh, uh, it was a new mill that started here. Pure coincidence, called Netherlands Overseas. Had no connection to me, uh, you know, I'm just a guy looking for a job. And right. uh, so it just started here in 1965 and uh, they offered me uh, a job. But then when I came here, the, uh, uh, I talked to the production manager in, who had a Dutch background and yeah. That's another thing, and I don't hold them against them, but I told them all the things that I wanted to do and, and my experience that I had, and I kind of think that he thought, well, I don't know, I don't want this guy around here. He's too ambitious, you know, so, and that sometimes happens. Right. You know, so first-class man, always higher, first-class man, first, second-class, not always, mm -hmm. you know, so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, uh, you know, the, uh, so I said, well, wait, and then, uh, you know, then, We'll try to find you a job, you know, right. so, and, uh, and that again was about seven or eight kilometers from town. So then my last paycheck of $160, I still had the paycheck. I think $160 for 40 hours, uh, 80 hours of work. I think I was making $2.50 an hour or so. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to send it to the uh, jail delivery in uh, Prince George. So I walked down that every day from there to the mill. I didn't want to miss the opportunity. Somebody doesn't show up, now I got a job. Right. right. So, uh, and that went on for about uh, five or six days and then... Things started to take a turn for the worse. Yeah, then I became concerned because I kind of felt dizzy and then I stood in the front door, in front of the door of the Salvation Army and I was too proud to go in. And not good, you know, because that's why they are there. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so anyway. So uh, then I went to the hospital. The old entrance of the hospital used to be in the front, and I slept right there next to the entrance, just in case something would go wrong. And uh, then on the on the following Saturday, I this was now about ten days that I found a bag of cookies and that I ate. And then the one thing that I did, I there was one fellow that was uh, working on the engineering of the mill, and as I was walking down Queensway on my way to the mill looking for the job. I saw him and he said, hey, how are you doing? And I said, yeah, good. And, and uh, he said, you want a coffee? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said to him, would you mind if I ask for a piece of pie? Oh. I haven't eaten in three days, four days. Oh. And he said, no, I have two. <laughs> anyway, so then, this was great. You know, so in any event, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, so, then I knew I had to go back to Quanell and find out what, you know, because I, I, I was in trouble. And so uh, I went back to Quanell to my, uh, uh, the, the lady that was uh, Mr. McEwen, uh, you know, that was the boarding room where I stayed. Mm -hmm. And she opened the door and she said, oh my God, come on in, come on in. So she fed me and then kind of got me cleaned up. And then we, she called Ernie McCatrick and he called the payroll clerk. Can you imagine? This is on a Saturday. <laughs> And, and she said, no, no, we send it to the Bank of Montreal, you know, so $160 and 60, uh, 65 cents or something like, I was the richest guy in the world because that was more than I came with, yeah. you know, when I left Amsterdam or Schiphol. Anyway, so I went back and, uh, you know, the, uh, I picked up my $160, I found a room and board closer to the mill, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had to share the room with a young kid. 
you know, but whatever, uh, you know, but it was close by and, uh, you know, and, and then from there and then, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I went to the mill and I just started working, even if they don't pay me. And I did clean up and then one day somebody did show up and I, they said, okay, well, you have the job. Well, look at that, you know, things turned around kind of for and you. And then very quickly I became a cleanup man, yeah. lumber pilot, mm -hmm. green chain foreman, back end foreman. Within a year and a half I was superintendent Perfect. of the mill, awesome. of the dry end of the mill, you know, the, uh, yeah, yeah, so. So you made it pretty far. Anyway, I kind of want to uh, leave it there so we can talk a little bit about the rest of uh, your the story into into chapter two. But wow, it was quite the wild ride from you know toddler to in your twenties. Yeah. Lots of things happened. Yeah, they did. <laughs>